On behalf of the Johnny Witzow Foundation and the Maxwell Institute, I'd like to welcome you to the Book of Mormon Conversations series. I'm Jacob Renneker. I'm director of the Johnny Witzow Foundation. I'm coming to you from Southern California, where the Witzow Foundation is headquartered, or next to the University of Southern California. Uh, Johnny Witzow Foundation is a nonprofit uh, that's committed to uh, interfaith dialogue and religious literacy, both in helping other academic and religious groups better understand the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and in helping Latter-day Saints to better understand their uh, neighbors of different faiths. Um, and we're thrilled to have uh, author of our book on uh, Enos German Omni, that's Dr. Sharon Harris here. Um, she's coming to us from Provo, Utah. Uh, Sharon is a assistant professor of English at Brigham Young University. Uh, she focuses on uh, early modern literature and its intersection with music. And in addition to those studies, she does um, uh, work on theology and has published there in uh, the Book of Mormon and History of Latter-day Saints Singles Wards. Um, to give you just a better idea of, uh, of Dr. Harris and some of her credentials, uh, she has degrees from Brigham Young University, uh, University of Chicago, and Fordham University, and has worked in public education, nonprofit arts administration, and academic publishing. And most importantly, she's a really great person. So, uh, Sharon, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we might as well just jump right in here uh, to some questions. Um, uh, I really enjoyed uh, your book, Sharon, uh, and Thanks. you mentioned that this is in your introduction, right? That this, that these are our books. Enos, uh, Jerem, and Omni are books that are often kind of the flyby books that people just kind of skim over. Um, uh, but you were able to unpack so much from these these itty bitty books, as you call them. Um, I was really impressed, and I think that it it gave a great kind of justification for this series as a whole that we've been talking about. Uh, that that even the smallest of books uh, reward serious and thoughtful uh, reading, and you did you did a tremendous job. So um, it, going back to your introduction, um, you suggest that uh, we should consider the dictation order as we try to understand the Book of Mormon as a whole. So tell us what you mean by dictation order and what you think it means for how we read the Book of Mormon as a whole, as well as where the small, these, these smallest books here fit into that whole story. Yeah, this is kind of interesting because uh, if you put things in dictation order, then these itty bitty books that I call them come at the end, um, come at the end of the whole Book of, Book of Mormon. So what it means is that the order that the Book of Mormon was translated and dictated by Joseph Smith is different than the order that we have it and we read it now. And that is simply that the small plates, 1st Nephi, 2nd Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Jerem, Omni, and it seems the words of Mormon, Mormon uh, they were tacked on at the end of Mormon and Moroni's portion of the record. And so jo it, the historical record bears out that Joseph Smith seems to have uh, translated what he called the Book of Lehi with the 116 lost pages and then moved on through the rest of the record. And then uh, after Moroni goes back to the small plates. And the significant part about that for my book is that it means that Enos, Jerem, and Omni are the last word of the Book of Mormon. Technically, it would be words of Mormon but that's not its own book and it's kind of an introductory portion. So I went with it being the end at Omni. 
And so, yeah, so what, so what, what difference, and you talk about this in your book, but I think just as a kind of a little teaser for people to, to get in and, and, and read more, um, what difference do you see that making for people who are used to reading the Book of Mormon and ending with Moroni? Well, I think it makes a huge difference because we, the most clear articulation of the covenant of the Book of Mormon comes in the small plates. And so if you read it in dictation order, you see the formation of the church, you see the growth of Christianity among the Lehite people, and then a sort of different uh, illustration of it with the Jaredites. And you see them fall and the end of the civilization, and then it comes back and re-articulates this covenant in the small plates. So it's almost a, a pre-cap. Yeah. <laughs> post, a it's, post pre-cap. Yeah, it's, it's the happening. prequel last. It's like the Star Wars okay. um, franchise. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's that, that's that's fascinating. I think you make a, a really compelling argument for uh, looking at those uh, because e whether or not you you read those uh, the last, you, you're suggesting that that's where it, you know, Joseph Smith ended, uh, what he finishes dictating with. So if you're looking at it kind of chronologically from what Joseph Smith is is, is dictating, then yeah, that. How, how, how does that kind of change? No, that's the, absolutely right. But, I, I mean, it seems that he gets clear about the covenant toward the end of the of the translation project, you know, and the, it, it's this clear statement there in Nephi quoting Isaiah, and I talk about in the book, I think the most pithy summary of this covenant is actually in Enos. And so, yeah. Yeah, that is that's great. Um, Okay, so moving past the introduction, because uh, we could spend a lot longer on the introduction, we could probably spend you, yeah. This book, if if you haven't if you haven't opened it yet, uh, or if you haven't even purchased it yet, I would highly encourage you all to do so. Um, uh, so there's 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 so much in here. I'll keep you chewing on um, on sections that you'll have to stop and kind of process. So um, moving on to Enos, and we'll just be able to highlight a few few portions here before we want to get to everyone's questions. Um, in the chapter on, on Enos, um, you use the idea of kenosis uh, to approach the book of Enos from a different angle than, than we typically do uh, in kind of church group settings uh, in Sunday school talking about it. Um, what is kenosis? Uh, and what role do you see it playing in the collective covenants that you highlight in Enos? Yeah, and thanks for bearing with me. I'll just tell everybody, I hope you don't have the echo anymore, but I do. <laughs> so that's, uh, if I'm tripping on my words a little bit, that's where that's why. Um, so kenosis is, it comes from the an idea that it comes in Philippians 2. And... That is that um, in Philippians 2, it talks about how Christ poured himself out and became of no reputation. That's the line in the King James Version. Other, uh, other ones say that it, it was he became as nothing. He emptied in himself. Self-emptying is the most common way that this gets rendered. And uh, I think, let me just introduce that that's what it is, and then let me review what I mean by co the collective covenant. Maybe we can pull them together. So the covenant of the Book of Mormon that we were talking about with dictation order, to me, it seems pretty clearly from the, you can see it on the title page, you can see it in Enos, you can see it um, throughout the Book of Mormon, but it is that a record of this people will survive when the Nephites are destroyed, and it will go forward into the future and come forth to a remnant of this people, most commonly uh, identified as the Lamanites, and that through this record, that remnant will know that they were part of a covenant with God, that they were part of, uh, that their fathers were part of this house of Israel. It's, I think, part of the larger Abrahamic coven uh, covenant. And so that's what the covenant of the Book of Mormon uh, seems to be about. And so it's a gathering in the future to regraft people into this covenant from uh, the Lehite ancient past. 
Okay, so kenosis, if it's this self-emptying, I want to make it clear that I don't think kenosis is quite exactly the same as humility, although it has an aspect of that. It's not uh, just sort of um, sanctification in a sort of abstract, broad sense. This self-emptying is somebody who has some kind of power or position or ability empties themselves in order to empower those who may not. And so this is what we see with Enos's prayer. He, the words of his father sink into his heart. He prays for forgiveness of his own sins and he receives that. And then he becomes excited and emboldened and he prays on behalf of the Nephites. He's emptying himself on behalf of his people. And he receives an answer about that. And then he says, you know what? I want to pour myself out in beh on behalf of the Lamanites as well. And so it's this struggle and wrestle to obtain a covenant that ensures that the Lamanites will receive uh, this record. They will receive salvation. They will know about their place in the covenant. And that's, I think, the beauty of kenosis is that Enos feels like he's in this uh, relationship with God where he's received blessings and he wants to use that position to secure blessings for other people as well. Uh, thank you. Um, so with kenosis, you point out in the book that it's, it's more than this idea of humility. It's mm -hmm. this kind of like full emptying oneself of, of power in order to empower other people. Um, right. who are not in a position of power, um, with Jesus being the, the prime example of that in Philippians exactly. 2. Um, you also add a caution about possibly taking that idea of self-emptying too far or perhaps in a, mm -hmm. in a harmful way. Can you, can you speak to that for a minute? Yeah, I think this is really important. Enos is made whole. That's the answer he gets from God his sins are forgiven and he's made whole. And it's from this position of wholeness that he feels he can empty himself out. So if we're in a position of brokenness, I don't think that means that we can't serve others or help them. It's not like that. But the ability to really pour oneself out to self empty and that that's a complete emptying comes from a place of wholeness in Christ. Um, so it doesn't mean that we just bend over backward and take abuse and let ourselves be dragged around by people who aren't, don't have our best interest at heart or are just using us for themselves. And that's why I think it's important that kenosis is someone who is empowered in some way, self empties to empower other people. Uh, good. And I like that. I like that you kind of preempted perhaps uh, people taking that idea the wrong way, right? Yeah, and, and, uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess in, in some ways, yeah. So uh, re read more about it in the book, uh, our dear audience. Um, and, and, and this, yes, this idea of, of, of kenosis uh, is, is a really rich way for understanding Enos's prayer um, using mm -hmm. a term typically don't use in uh, Latter-day Saint settings, um, a traditional kind of general Christian uh, theological category uh, that can be applied to the Book of Mormon with, with, with rich uh, results. Um, so I'm re really glad you did that. Uh, that was really helpful for, uh, for me in, in, in seeing Enos in a new way, uh, again, after, after reading it several times uh, in the past. So, <laughs> Um, let's see here. So with, let's move on to Jerem because I want to get, have a lot of time for, for questions from, from the audience, um, as much time as possible here. So, uh, moving on from, uh, from Jerem, uh, or from Enos to Jerem, uh, you bring up the term, uh, millenarianism, uh, right. which you describe as the orientation toward an oncoming destruction that is followed by some sort of utopia. So something like the second coming of Jesus uh, and the calamities preceding that, followed by a thousand years of peace. 
-hmm. So how do you see this mindset uh, relating first to the book of Jerem, you know, how, how that fits into the book of Jerem, but then you use this term, the messy middle to describe mm -hmm. where Jerem is in relation to these larger pictures of final, final times, final days, uh, destruction followed by peace. Um, so yeah, so, so first, uh, million, millenarianism and how it relates to, to the book of Jerem and then your phrase, the messy middle. Yeah. Okay. There are a lot of steps here. So, um, let's talk about millenarianism first and then we can talk about the middle. And, uh, I think it's useful to identify why would Jerem have anything to do with millenarianism? Um, because if this is anticipating the end, some kind of apocalypse or destruction or something, Jerem just doesn't seem like a candidate we would expect, right? But this was something that was so interesting as I was digging into the material, reading reading Enos and Jerem and Omni more closely. Uh, or Jerem, he talks about how he's not including his own prophecies and revelations. He seems very committed to prophecy, to feeling the spirit. I think I had, uh, I talked about this in the book, that I had grown up thinking it's such a short book, maybe they weren't as faithful, maybe these were the slackers in the Book of Mormon. And I just don't feel that way about Jerem anymore. Uh, he seems to have been very aware and very committed. And he would have known about his father Enos's answer to his prayer. And so this is, this answer is the Book of Mormon Covenant that we've been talking about. It's the uh, promise that this record will be preserved. And the Lord basically says as much to Enos, the, the Nephites are not going to make it. They're going to get wiped off. They're going to dwindle in wickedness. I mean, it maybe doesn't come out with that directly, but it's that idea. This They're not going to make it. And so, yes, uh, the Lord promises to reserve a record to go forth to the Lamanites in the future. Um, and the Lord also notes that the Nephites won't make it because of their wickedness. Okay, so where does that put Jerem? It means that if he takes this seriously, that he knows that the Nephites are going to be destroyed. And he's anticipating this apocalypse. And he's also knowing that he has to keep the Nephites righteous so that they won't be destroyed, particularly so that their record can survive long enough that it can go forth to the Lamanites. So if they biff this up and just mess up within a generation or two, they may not even be able to get the prophecy fulfilled. And that's the kind of bind that he's in. Um, and so he talks about, it's kind of interesting if you look at verses 3, 10, 12, there's lots of times that he says, okay, so we had to really bear down in strictness on them and they, we got them to be righteous enough that they wouldn't be wiped off. Like it seems to really be something on his mind. Um, and so they feel this looming threat. And of course, now we're in the latter day dispensation and we're awaiting the second coming. Um, so I did not expect to see that parallel with Jerem, but I think it's there. So then the question comes, how do we anticipate our own you know, apocalypse? How, what does our millenarianism look like? Um, and I think, like we saw, I think it would be, if you were in Jerem's place and you're watching the Lamanites and you know that, that Nephites will be destroyed for wickedness, anytime you can say, oh, we're at least more righteous than they are, then it might feel like, okay, we're good, right? And it turns into this comparison instead of um, sort of looking inward and maintaining your own righteousness. Now, I'm not saying it, it's like that for Jerem per se, but that's like a constant temptation. Um, and I think that we fall into this. I think I've grown up anyway, comparing myself as a member of the church with the Nephites more than with the Lamanites. But the trouble is if you compare with the Nephites, it didn't go well for them, right? And so then we also have this, temptation to look at the depravity of the world and be like, see, we're the good ones, they're having a hard time, and it changes the way that we anticipate the Lord's coming, right? 
So it's easy to look at the bad stuff and take that as signs of the times and signs of the, you know, of the end. But there are other signs as well. There's temple work, there's missionary work, there's um, flooding the earth with the Book of Mormon, right? Um, there's gathering people in the covenant from all over. And these are more proactive. And so I think we can break down the ideas of millenarianism with this set of questions. Does the world have to get bad enough or do the Lord's covenant people have to become good enough for Jesus to come again? And that I think reframes what we're looking at there. So that's what I would say about millenarianism. There's a lot of steps there, but I hope that made sense. <laughs> uh, it made sense to me possibly because I read your chapter <laughs> and so it, you, you did a great job of explaining it there so if anybody wants a, kind of to a, a slower walk through what Sharon uh, just just covered there about Jerem and uh, and millenarianism uh, please read her chapter on on the, on the book of Jerem um, and I think one, one of the things that I liked in that chapter was regardless of which of those two views you take you know whether we have to be the, the world has to get bad enough or uh, in order for, for Jesus to come again, or if the world has to be good enough for Jesus to come again. Regardless, you say that Jesus needs uh, a, a Zion people. Right. Mm -hmm. to, to be there, right? Yeah. So, and and uh, Jesus says that, um, Elder Christofferson said that in 2019 General Conference. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense that he, he may not be able to come until there's a people that has done their part, right, to be ready um for that and so uh that i think is where we can think about the messy middle because jerem i mean we look at the book of mormon now and we're like jerem was in the middle of nothing right like if you think about whatever cross-country drive is the most uneventful and jerem seems to be in the middle of that right it's easy to to pass over but uh, at the time, he didn't know that, you know, I mean, he's thinking, what if we get destroyed? And I think it's really easy for us, especially, I had written most of this before 2020, and now we've had this year 2020, which is going to be feel infamous for a lot of us as being like the most eventful year um, with climate change changes or uh, natural disasters or political upheaval or whatever it is, right? Uh, but even so, we may feel like, oh, this is the end times, this is it. Maybe, but I think it still makes us ask, does the Lord have a covenant people that's ready? And if he doesn't, we might actually be closer to the middle than we realize. Um, and what does the middle look like? Dispensations are long, right? Um, they can be hundreds of years. We're pretty far away from the first vision. Um, we haven't had anything added as a section to the Doctrine and Covenants for over 100 years. We've had official declarations, but there's not a, as much canonized scripture, which is to say that if people found our scriptures in the future, they might look at this time period and be like, oh, it looks like a lot wasn't happening uh, the way that we look at these small books, right? So if we're, if we're possibly in the middle, or at a minimum, we need to keep ourselves ready or, or try to prepare to be the covenant people the Lord needs, then um, I think it looks like a lot more diligent, quiet faithfulness than sort of scary signs of the times. Um, we might have the scary parts too, but all we can do is try to fulfill our part of the covenant to fulfill our part of those prophecies. Great, yeah, and, and I think you did a really good job of highlighting how uh, the book of Jerem can serve as a way for people today to kind of look at, at how they fit in. So using kind of Jerem right. as an example of that kind of mindset, yeah. uh, productive, uh, healthy, positive mindset that's oriented toward what is good uh, and what is the best and be able to develop in that way, regardless of where exactly along the, the timeline we are, right. uh, the people who are living their entire lives in that way. So that, wonderful, again, I can't speak highly enough of a, 
a chapter. Well, chapter. I should just say, I mean, I am not pretending to know when the Lord's coming, right? No man knoweth the hour. Um, nobody knows. But I think these are important ways to frame it. And uh, one of the things that really struck me about Jerem is some of his um, best characteristics are in what he leaves out. He opts not to write his all of his prophecies and revelations to save room so that the record can do what it's prophesied to do. Uh, he, I talk about this more, but he opts not to continue some of the derogatory um, representations of the Lamanites that his ancestors did and he just kind of quietly leaves it out and it's kind of thankless that's the thing about the middle is it's not like you're going to get a lot of recognition but you need to do it anyway <laughs> so right right uh that's one, one of the things i really liked was looking at kind of mining the space around jerem uh mm -hmm. and how valuable that can be not just what is written and stated but what is not there um right. and i think you uh, I think you did a good a, a good job kind of modeling how any reader can look at the text, not just okay, what, what is being said, but by virtue of the fact that this is being said, there's all of these other hundred thousand millions of words and stories that are not being said. So why right. this story and not others? Why this mm -hmm. word? Um, why bring this up and not? And so if Jerem isn't talking about much, then why is he not including? Right those sort of things. And I thought that was a, a great way, uh, a refreshing way, I think, to approach well-worn scripture is to look mm -hmm. at what's not being said. Mm -hmm. uh, right. and I think it did a right. fantastic job, but I think it's worth, definitely worth thinking about um, for readers, not just in the book of Jerem, but anywhere else uh, in mm -hmm. scripture. So wonderful. Okay, so now wrapping up our portion here, um, I'm just kind of going through some of the high points of the book. Uh, in your chapter on Omni, uh, when you look at how the small plates are passed down, you give special attention to the different types of relationships mm -hmm. that allow the Book of Mormon to be preserved. So not just, and you provide a, a beautiful chart uh, that shows exactly mm -hmm. who passed to who and, and when and how that all works out. That's, um, that's credit to Doug Thomas. He did the design work and it's gorgeous. Well, thank you, Doug. You made it very easy to follow. So, so you, so you do address that and the importance of the actual kind of passing and handing of plates and what what that means, um, what that might mean of in terms of what they were actually doing when they're handing it to someone else and their responsibilities. Um, but you go beyond that to looking at the types of relationships that are allowing these plates to be passed down, and you call those. Uh, lineal and lateral links that allow the Book of Mormon, this message to come down um, to us. Um, what is it about those? Maybe you can speak a bit to what you mean by lineal and lateral links um, and why you think it matters, that concept matters to us today. Yeah, this was so striking to me. Um, first of all, it's worth noting that these small plates are taking a different journey than the primary records of the people, right? Those are being passed down through the kings. It's kind of a set governmental path that they follow. Uh, but these get siphoned off in their first handoff. They don't go to Nephi's posterity, they go to his brother. And so I call that a lateral link and it jumps sideways. And then they go down through Jerem's line for a number of times. Uh, Enos, Jerem, Omni. Omni gives them to his son, Amaron. And then for whatever reason, we don't really know, Amaron gives them to his brother, Chemish. So you have lineal uh, passage of the plates and also lateral. And it struck me that Jerem and Omni both start talking about how we have to care for these plates and keep them going. Uh, uh, we keep this commandment that the genealogy of our fathers may be kept. Um, or that the genealogy may be kept. He doesn't, I don't know if they say of their fathers. And that struck me because Nephi says explicitly, this is not to give a history of my people or, or a genealogy really, right? Um, so is it that they don't understand what this is about? And I think what it ends up being is that the physical passing of the plates is 
part of knitting them together in the covenant. The fact that the plates survive and make it from one person to the next and manage to get all the way down, eventually being passed to Benjamin, that's another lateral link. Amalekai receives them um, and then passes them laterally to Benjamin. And then eventually Mormon finds them, adds them to his record, and they get delivered to Joseph Smith. Uh, that handoff, that in-person transaction is uh, the way that the scripture is preserved, the covenant is preserved, but it also typifies the relationships that the covenant actually means. You have to have these people who are custodians of the plates be faithful in taking care of them and link themselves to another person. And it's individual, it's one by one, in helping the plates survive. And that's what the covenant means, is that we have these individual one-on-one -on -one relationships where we're all bound together. And that's through lineal uh, relationships, but also through lateral relationships. It can be uh, siblings, it can be friends, it can be uh, people that we work with and we may not always want to, but we find a way to have a good relationship anyway. We can be bound together with all these people. And that is a way of ensuring that everybody is included and covered in the covenant. Yeah, I like that. And that kind of goes back to what you were talking about with the kind of collective covenant uh, versus an individual right. covenant. Mm -hmm. First in Enos, right? That that oftentimes uh, in the, the, at least the church, uh, Latter-day Saints circles, you know, we often emphasize individual covenants that are made with uh, right. God, right? individual and, and, and keeping your end gods if you're, if you're looking at it as a transaction, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. but but with Enos, you point out that he's not looking at his a personal kind of covenant with God in terms of his worthiness or him agreeing to do certain things for his own personal salvation, but that he's looking at a larger covenant, right? A, a, a kind right. of communal covenant, which is which is very much you know a, a, an, an Israelite and Jewish idea that it's this kind of that this group, they're only saved insofar as they're saved together as a people. Right. Uh, and so this is, yeah, so when you're talking about the lineal and lateral uh, moves uh, of the uh, of the plates and how those are linked together, I, I think you did an excellent job of showing how we can be connected. We have to be connected to other people and not just, so mm -hmm. that, yes, that causes us to center on uh, or take seriously our lineal, right? Uh, relationships of, of parents and our children, um, but also just as important are those lateral moves to making connections mm -hmm. with the other people in our congregations, uh, in our communities, and, and going both kind of this horizontal and vertical uh, nature is they're both important and that uh, mm -hmm. the Book of Mormon was kind of serving to kind of bring all of those uh, those connections together and that can do the same thing uh, today. So I, I, thought that, I thought that was a, uh, a really insightful um, uh, section of, of your book, um, which again, I Thanks. encourage all of you to, to, to read. Um, okay, well, um, now let's go to uh, questions from our lovely audience. So um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, you're you're able to ask questions here on Crowdcast by looking at the bottom uh, of your screen and there's an ask a question section. So you can either submit your own questions uh, or you can uh, vote for questions that others have asked. And if you would like to see that question answered, then uh, click the up arrow above that to vote for that question. And we'll uh, ask first those questions that have been voted for most. So please jump on there, take a look at those questions. We'll try to answer as many as possible. If we aren't able to get to them, um, Sharon has graciously agreed to uh, answer some of the unanswered questions uh, after this is this is finished, and we'll send out answers to all of those questions, a transcript of those, uh, and an email to everyone who's registered uh, for this event. So no question will be left uh, unanswered uh, in at least maybe a line uh, by Sharon. Um, uh, but we'll do our best to get through some right now. Um, so with that uh, being said, on to your questions. So uh, Amy Nelson asked, or stated first, Amy, uh, I love how you talk about how, although we often draw parallels between ourselves as members of the church and the members of the church who are most visible in the Book of Mormon, 
You then say that if we continue that to the end, uh, we are almost guaranteed to be too comfortable with subtle forms of racism, sexism, and corruption. Uh, Amy asks, uh, well, she would love to hear more about this and how we can better open our eyes to the broader narrative. So uh, how do we, I guess to, to say this in the form of a question, uh, how do we guard against identifying as members of, of, of the church, uh, identifying ourselves with the good guys in the Book of Mormon at the best of times? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how, how do we move beyond just doing that? And looking yeah. Larger picture. This is a great question. And right. I'll just take a, a second to say, I, out of the corner of my eye, I'm seeing some of the stuff go through the chat and it's fun to see some of those comments. I'm glad people are uh, talking with each other. Um, so this comes up because I, like I had mentioned, I grew up identifying primarily with the Nephites. Um, I think that was kind of the norm in a lot of church conversations that I would hear. Um, they were the ones that seemed to be members of the church um, for the most part, and I was a member of the church, and so it's this easy parallel. The trouble is that, as we've seen, the Nephites are too wicked, they get destroyed. And um, part of that seems to be that they, for one example, they don't accept that the Lamanites can change or that they can have good things to offer. For example, they don't necessarily believe Samuel the Lamanite sufficiently, or even after the sign is given, they don't record his prophecy. Um, so the sort of racial tensions that come throughout the Book of Mormon, that seems to be something that the Nephites don't get right uh, a fair amount. Uh, the Nephites don't seem to be as attentive to women, as, frankly, as the Lamanites are. The Lamanite queens seem to have more authority. We don't really hear about Nephite queens. Uh, the Lamanite woman Abish is able to get a whole bunch of people to come see what happened. We don't have as many stories about that for Nephite women. Jacob chastises the Nephites that the Lamanites are treating their wives and children better than the Nephites do. So this seems to be a gaping hole in the Nephites' behavior and it may be part of their overall wickedness. I, I, I think it is. There's some people doing some really good work on this right now. Um, so if we want to identify with the Nephites, we got to kind of see the things that they're susceptible to are probably the same kinds of things that we are also susceptible to. And Mormon kind of breaks in at the beginning of Helaman and says, watch and see how these secret combinations, which infiltrated the government, which were people that were all around them. They were in disguise, they couldn't recognize them. Watch how this destroys the whole Nephite civilization. They're susceptible to corruption. What do we do about that? Um, so Kim Berkey is a friend. She's written the volume on Helaman for this series and it's terrific. So I'll recommend that to you when it's released. But one of the things that she's talked about is that secret combinations, the corruption, I think also the failure to appreciate uh, what the Lamanites have to offer or what women have to offer, it all comes from an inability or an unwillingness, it might be more accurate, to look in and see what do I need to change, right? If we're constantly comparing outwardly and looking at others and well, at least I'm not as bad as them or they do this and they're worse. And frankly, I feel like that is so rampant in our cultural conversations right now. I feel like it's there in politics. I feel it's there in the way we try to prioritize who should get special treatment or whatever, instead of looking in and saying, okay, essentially, Lord, is it I? And that's what I think the, the kind of difficult ending for the Nephites in the Book of Mormon invites us to do. Be careful in, in drawing this comparison. I like that uh, that more holistic look mm -hmm. at the Nephite people, right? And so that, that that requires a different a different relationship with the text, right? A more a more uh, honest uh, and careful relationship with the text than we typically uh, see. So that that that, that was great. Um, and again, if you want if you want more on that, there's a tremendous section that uh, Sharon really asks a number of really pointed questions uh, about. Mm -hmm 
who you consider as your enemy. Um, and, uh, and I think there's some real important relevance for our own, uh, our own time. Uh, and so that, that, that section is, is well worth, uh, well worth your time reading. Um, so thank you for asking that question, Amy. Um, next question here, uh, is about, uh, going back to, or still in the book of Enos, then, uh, the phrase, my faith, uh, began to be unshaken. Mm -hmm. Um, so the question uh, is, uh, what do you think the implications of that were, especially as it related to Enos? So what, what do you think that phrase, yeah. my faith began to be unshaken, what did that mean for Enos and what impact did that have on him as a prophetic figure? Yeah, that, I think this is a great question. And this is something that I really kind of mulled over a lot. I don't think that um, as much of this made it into the book. <laughs> um, I think the phrase began to be unshaken is interesting. You, you would assume, you know, a building is, something is unshaken or it isn't, but what does it mean to begin to be unshaken? And so for me, that suggests that Enos coming into this kind of confidence with God and pouring himself out as he does and taking on more and more, you know, I'll pray for the Nephites. I'll pray on behalf of the Lamanites. And something that I talk about in the book is it is my, sense supposition that when he says this is a wrestle this is a struggling a many long strugglings he says that this isn't just a one night prayer and that's just my own experience is that god doesn't tend to give most of us life-changing long-term answers on a sort of one-time petition so He's struggling with this for a while, and that it's a process where he can start to feel that his shape, his faith begins to be unshaken. Um, and so he takes that and isn't content with just the blessings for himself or the blessings for his people, and he expands it to others. I think it's really beautiful. Uh, thank you. That, that last question was from uh, Corey Howell. So thanks, Corey, for asking that question. Um, our next uh, question here is from uh, Dana, uh, and uh, this question is about the book of Jerem, uh, specifically about the phrase, uh, looking forward unto the Messiah and believe in him as though he already was. So Dana asks, can you share any thoughts or insights on what this would mean for Book of Mormon peoples, uh, in other words, looking forward, uh, mm -hmm. and also what this principle would mean for us today? I'm so glad you asked this question because it's one of the coolest parts of this of these three books, and we haven't talked about it yet. Uh, looking forward to Christ as though he already was. I talk about this in the book as something about messianic time. And uh, it plays with time here, right? What does it mean to be saved by a savior that hasn't even come yet? Um, and I think that's the implication for Book of Mormon people, as as you're pointing out. But I think it holds something for us as well, because we're anticipating the Lord coming, right? Um, so what, is, what would it mean to live now as though he already was here in the second coming? I think that's part of why we have to ask ourselves, how can we be a people that is covenant and ready to usher in the second coming, right? Uh, also, Messianic times is something that gets talked about in theology and philosophy sometimes, and it's a way of living outside of the sort of constant barrage of demands and the distractions and the things that just eat up so much of most of our everyday attention. Adam Miller, he wrote the book for Mormon, the book Mormon in this series. And he also wrote a book called Early Resurrection where he talks about this verse, most of the book, and how do we live in Christ now, even if he isn't here yet. And I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not alone in this. I've had experiences as a disciple where everything may seem to be falling down around me, but if I feel close to the Lord, or I feel the spirit speak to me, time stills and it's okay. I can do what I need to do and be confident in that relationship with God. 
and kind of see clearly what's most important. And I think living in Christ allows us to do that. It allows us to not be bound by celestial concerns um, all the time. Great. Oh, uh, well said. Uh, okay, thank you, Dana, for that for that question. Um, next question here is back to the book of Enos. Uh, Richard Anderson uh, would like to know more of your thoughts on uh, his phrase, my guilt was swept away. Um, so could you explain how you see that functioning in Enos, what that means, uh, what, you, what you see it meaning to Enos, the possible meanings of that, uh, and how that can translate to a person's experience uh, with their own life of that kind of sweeping away of, of guilt? Yeah, Richard, I, I think I saw this question and you point out that guilt being swept away isn't the same thing as forgiveness. A person can be forgiven and maybe still be kind of torn up personally. You're feeling a lot of guilt. And I think that's a really important separation to make. Enos makes that separation, right? He talks about knowing that his sins were forgiven and then he, he knew that the Lord could not lie and so his guilt was swept away. They seem to be, uh, they don't happen exactly at the same time. And I think we obviously have to have our sins forgiven in order to be redeemed, but we may still struggle with our own personal sense of guilt. And I think the Lord wants to, to take that away for us as well. I think that includes seeing ourselves as truly loved by him, uh, that we don't have to hang on to that and that we can accept the view he has of us and let go of that guilt. Uh, if we don't, I think it's harder to serve, to be from a place of wholeness that, that Enos felt. Thank you for that, Richard, for the question. Um, uh, we have a couple questions that have to do with the amount of time uh, between Lehi uh, and his and his group leaving Jerusalem, and when Enos uh, began his writing uh, on the plates. So maybe could you, because we have a couple questions uh, that that relate to that. Maybe you could talk about how you're, uh, you're paying attention to the amount of time between when Lehi left and Enos's writing. Uh, how that struck you, and what that, how you feel that impacted Enos uh, as a figure, as an author here in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, you start doing the math on the years that they put in this, and it's really bizarre. So Enos f finished his record 179 years after uh, Lehi and Sarai and their family left to Jerusalem. And if you, if you think about that, I mean, this is something that I give the example of in the Book of Mormon, um, it would mean that your grandparents immigrated to the United States, let's say in 1841, and only now in 2020, are you the same age that Enos was uh, when he finished his record? So these are incredibly long generations. Some people have said, that's probably not likely. Maybe there was another generation in there or whatever. And yet Enos talks about hearing his father preach Surely he would have had to be very young when that happened. Uh, Jacob was probably much older. Maybe he didn't live for very much of Enos's life. Maybe Enos's mother was much younger, that seems likely. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Marilyn Robinson's novel, Gilead. This is actually what it reminded me of. It reminded me of John Ames, the pastor in that novel, writing these letters to his son so that his son would have something to remember him by. Um, and so when I think about Enos probably reflecting on Jacob's words when, from when he was very young and that that is what he takes when he goes hunting in the forest, it's, it's a reflection over a lot of years and his struggle is perhaps over a, a lot of time. He has this experience and then lives for much longer before he writes the, the record and hands it over to Jerem. Um, yeah, it just gives me a better sense for what 
his place in the family may have looked like. And that, yeah, that was something that uh, I hadn't looked at before was the, where, where does Enos fit into the family? Like, right, usually you just mm -hmm. see them as kind of in a vacuum as a prophet who's writing the scriptural text. And then you see them kind of within the mm -hmm. borders of those texts, but then looking at where, where the, the blurring between those borders of chapter you know ends or book ends of say Jacob and then to Enos uh, of what Enos's father's relationship with right. his parents was like uh -huh. and so that so Jacob's uh, you know persona everything the person that he is and became would have been uh, affected by how he related not just to his 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 siblings uh, but also his parents uh, and right. then how that really kind of trickled down to, to him and then Enos, how he is then interacting with this other person who's entangled in this web of relationships uh, that we don't typically consider uh, of Jacob's age with compared to Lehi's age, right? Sariah's mm -hmm. age. Right. Um, so that was something I thought was incredibly uh, important uh, that you do really well within all three of these books is looking at the relationships, right? I think that's that was one yeah. of the through lines that I saw. They really seem to uh, well, drive it and, and, they, and it connects with the idea of covenant as well. So Yeah, and so how, so maybe kind of as a like closing follow-up question uh, to this is, uh, what difference have you found as you've looked at the relationships that make up the Book of Mormon? Um, what, what, how, how has that changed how you have interacted with uh, the Book of Mormon? Again, fo focusing on the relationships that are there. Hmm. Um, well, it personalizes it for one. I mean, one of the things that keeps coming back to me is that these are imperfect people that are trying to live their covenant. And that's, that's I identify with that, right? I think a lot of us do. And the, that is also enough. The Lord can work with that. It, it, the miracle of the Book of Mormon can happen through those kinds of uh, imperfect people. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing and I talk about this a little bit at the end, is just that what, we talk about eternal families in the church a lot, and I think it can be difficult to see that in the Book of Mormon per se. We, we don't get a lot of talk about the temple ceiling or anything like that. Um, and yet the Book of Mormon is a story of a family. And so that is beautiful in its own right, but I think it also can raise the question, we talk a lot more about the Book of Mormon as being a testament of Christ. And for me, that invites us to ask, okay, what is the connection between families and Christ? And I think it is this collective covenant and that the family is so much bigger than just whoever, whomever I may be living with, you know, at a given time. It stretches back and forward into time and it stretches out to people that, I may not have known before. My husband is from southeastern Texas, a lot of Louisiana roots. And when we were married, my grandpa, who did the ceiling, said, this union joins these families together. And so now there's this family in Idaho and these, this family in southeast Texas that have this connection. And it's really beautiful. It happens through our personal relationships. That's great. Yeah. So I like that you combined in that in that chapter uh, on Omni, uh, but I actually threw out right that the, the it's not an either or with like mm -hmm. a, a you know a covenant with God, an individual covenant or uh, a group. It's it's all of these that are together that are working in conjunction with each other, but that they're all consisting of relationships. Right. So mm -hmm. every covenant is rooted in some sort of relationship. Um, and uh, just a teaser for the end of this book. Uh, you kind of end on this really powerful uh, idea about how the book of, uh, of Omni ends uh, and what that might mean for the end of the whole Book of Mormon, if you're looking at dictation order. Uh, it was one of probably the uh, hardest gut punch I've received uh, for an idea uh, in, uh, in writing about the Book of Mormon. It was just so effective uh to me that so i won't, I won't say anything more that, that was my experience when i thought of it i mean frankly i was trying to finish a draft of this chapter 
and I was up late and I was tired. I mean, I think it was like three or four in the morning. It was late. I was just like, I got to get this finished. And I hadn't had this idea before. And I had been going through all the themes we're talking about. And then this new way of thinking about the last few verses of Omni, it kind of, it kind of came to me. It felt, it felt like a gift and um, it was really striking. So yeah, I guess I'll leave it like that as a teaser. <laughs> yeah, as a teaser. So it, cer it certainly was a gift uh, that, yeah, that it, it, it hit me hard. And I think it just kind of hammered home uh, in a deeper way themes that you brought up throughout the entire book. And so, again, uh, highly recommend you getting uh, this book uh, and reading it. If you want, you can skip to the very end to see what we're talking about. But don't, don't spoil it. I, I, I don't want to spoil it. Oh, don't do that. Deserve, don't do that. It's better if you read through. Yeah. You deserve to read through from the beginning to the end. It'll, uh -huh. it'll, it'll be even, uh, even more meaningful for you. So, yeah. uh, Sharon, thank you so much uh, for taking the thank time you. to answer our audience questions. Uh, our lovely audience, thank you so much for tuning in, uh, for asking such great questions, um, and for engaging uh, uh, civilly uh, in the comment section on the side. I see it's been quite active. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. As I mentioned before, Sharon uh, will be answering some of the unanswered questions, at least a line, a short answer for some of those uh, questions. So uh, we'll be sending a transcript of Sharon's answers to those uh, questions, those unanswered questions out to everyone who is on here tonight, who's registered for this event. You'll be receiving an email that has a transcript of those questions. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, audience. Uh, for joining us. Um, we're going to have a replay of this available uh, sometime uh, this coming week. Uh, so if you want to rewatch uh, any portion of it, you can skip around um, or you can just watch the whole thing from beginning to end because why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Um, our next, I want to remind everyone that our next uh, Book of Mormon conversation uh, will be on October 11th. So we have a, a couple weeks off. Um, October 11th at 5 o'clock p.m. Um, Pacific time. And that's going to be with Professor Jim Falkner uh, to talk about his volume on Mosiah. Uh, and Dr. Michael Stanley, who's the vice chair of the Widso Foundation, uh, he will be, uh, be asking the questions and facilitating questions from you, the audience. So again, thank you all. Uh, encourage you to check out the other books um, and the other interviews that we've done here, question and answer sessions with audience members uh, as part of this uh, Maxwell Institute's uh, brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon series. So thank you all. Good night. Thank you.